I'm Kirk, I'm one of the ASMs. Becky, stage manager. Sarah, I'm also one of the ASMs. Hi, I'm Scott. I am an actor. What roles are you playing, Scott? Le uh, Lord Edgar, Jane, intruder. <laughs> I'm Jason. I'm the other actor. I'm playing Lady Enid Nicodemus Alcazar. I am Bearclaw. I'm playing the lighting designer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Carl. I'm the set designer. I'm Spike, the director. Okay, so um, I've been delightfully delving into the brain of Charles Ludlum lately, which is warped and crazy <laughs> and fun. Um, as I think most of you are aware, I did the show before years ago. I was one of the actors. I played Scott's role, um, did it in Montana, and then we brought it back to Washington, so it was all portable and crazy, but fun, fun as hell. Um, one of my, probably my favorite theater memories, so I hope to make it as fun for all of us as it was for me. It was a blast. So, starting with Theater of the Ridiculous, <coughs> where this kind of all got its background, and most of this is coming right off of Wikipedia, so um, I'll just <laughs> I'll own up to that right now. Um, theater of the Ridiculous, a theatrical genre that began in the American movement in New York in 1965, with the beginnings of the Playhouse of the Ridiculous, spin-off group formed in 67 was the Ridiculous Theater Company, formed by Ludlum, of course. Uh, it made a break with dominant trends in theater of naturalistic acting and realistic settings. It employed a very broad acting style, often with surrealistic stage settings and props, frequently making a conscious effort at being shocking or disturbing. Ridiculous theater brought some elements of queer camp performance to avant-garde theater. Cross-gender casting was common, with players often recruited from non-professional sources, such as drag queens or other street stars. The scenarios used in ridiculous plays were often parodies or reworkings of pop culture fiction, used as vehicles for social commentary or humor. Improvisation played a large role in the often chaotic, ridiculous productions where the script was treated just as a starting point. The phrase, the theater of the ridiculous, was created uh, by the author Ronald Table, who described some of his works which were later recognized as the beginning of the genre. Uh, in a reference to our Toad's concept of theater of the absurd, 65 table promoted the first ridiculous performances with the one-line manifesto, we have passed beyond the absurd, our position is absolutely preposterous. Some prominent productions of the movement, The Life of Lady Godiva, Conquest of the Universe, When Queens Collide, and Camille and Irma Vett. Since then, the genre has broken out more mainstream theatrical productions such as Bat Boy, Year in Town, Reefer Madness, the theater of the ridiculous became a strong influence on 70s culture. Elements of it can be seen in glam rock, disco, and most directly in the Rocky Horror subculture. Okay, so that's kind of some of the early background of the ridiculous movement. Ludlum and Vaccaro had kind of a falling out, and that's when Ludlum formed his own company because his ideals were a little different. Um, I thought it was appropriate to read Ludlum's manifesto for the Ridiculous Theater, which is pretty short. Um, the Ridiculous Theater, Scourge of, Scourge of Human Folly by Charles Ludlum, aim to, beyond, to, no, excuse me, to get beyond nihilism by revaluing combat. Thought was interesting. Axioms to a theater for ridicule. One, you are a living mockery of your own ideals. If not, you have set your ideals too low. <laughs> Two, the things one takes seriously are one's weaknesses. Three, just as many people who claim belief in God disprove it with their every act, so too there are those whose every deed, though they say there is no God, is an act of faith. Four, evolution is a conscious process. Five, and this one will be important for us as we work on this play, bathos is that which is intended to be sorrowful, but because of the extremity of its expression becomes comic. Pathos is that which is meant to be comic, but because of its extremity of expression, becomes sorrowful. Some things which seem to be opposites are actually different degrees of the same thing. Six, the comic hero thrives on his vices. The tragic hero is destroyed by his virtue. Moral paradox is the crux of drama. Seven, the theater is a humble, materialist enterprise which seeks to produce riches of the imagination not the other way around. The theater is an event, not an object. 
theater workers need not blush and conceal their desperate struggle to pay the landlords their rents. Theater without the stink of art. Instructions for use. This is a farce, not Sunday school. Illustrate hedonistic calculus. Test out a dangerous idea, a theme that threatens to destroy one's whole value system. Treat the material in a madly farcical manner without losing the seriousness of the theme. Show how paradoxes arrest the mind. Scare yourself a bit along the way. That was his manifesto for his theater company. Can I get a copy of that? Oh, yeah. Okay, so background. Mystery Verm Bavette was first produced in Ludlum's Ridiculous Theater Company, opening off-off Broadway in New York's Greenwich Village Theater in September 84, closed in April 86. It starred Ludlum as Lady Enid, the new mistress of the manor, and Nicodemus. Everett Quinton, who was Ludlum's partner, was Lord Edgar, the master of the manor, housekeeper, <coughs> among other characters. The, quote, cast and crew won a special Drama Desk Award, uh, Charles Ledlam and Quinton wrote the 19, or won the 1985 Obie Award for Ensemble Performance. The show was later produced off-Broadway at the West Side Theater in September 98 through July 99 with Quinton and St uh, Stefan De Rosa. The production won the 99 Lucille Lortel Award for Outstanding Revival, along with Outer Critics Circle Award nominations for <coughs> Outstanding Revival of a Play, Outstanding Lighting Design, Outstanding Costume Design. In 91, Irma Vep was the most produced play in the United States, and in 2003, it became the longest running play ever produced in Brazil. <laughs> Factoid we all wanted to know. Can we take this production to Brazil, please? Yeah. <laughs> um, the New York Times review of in 1984 opened, quote, Charles Ludlam's latest ridiculous theatrical company escapade, The Mystery of Irma Vep, begins at Mandacrest on the Moors, in the manner of Rebecca, then, after wuthering heights of hilarity, it slinks off to Egypt for scenes spliced from The Mummy's Curse. The evening winds up with a howler, courtesy of The Wolfman. Naturally, the entire collage is filtered through the eclectic memory and perverted imagination of Mr. Ludlam as author, director, and star, and went on, despite in all dastardy, the playwright has an underlying affection for all his characters even for the misunderstood vampire. And that's important. I, um, something I kept finding along the way of doing my research is how much he and his company loved their characters. <clears throat> While they were sending up these forms and the culture and the movies and all these things, they really loved and cherished the characters. And I think that's important for us to keep in mind as we work on it. We are not making fun of the characters, we're making fun of the situations in which they find themselves. Right? Um, this often produced play, uh, but always over embellished play, is a collage and homage of B movies, melodrama, and queer, as in strange theater, says Kevin G. Coleman, Shakespeare and Company of Irma Vep. Written by the late Charles Ludlam, this high camp romp is a brilliant send up of many forms which nearly conceals its serious intent and respect for gender presentation, but is guaranteed to make your head spin in a good way. Concept notes. Um, and these numbers are thrown out at random, but I put that the show is about 90% about the story, the characters, the situation. The other 10%, or maybe a little less, is about the actors themselves performing it, right? There's internal references, as you can tell, when they like poke fun at the fact they're changing clothes so fast, or they're too slow, or whatever. And so there's some of that that we'll be playing up as well. Um, one of the things I talked with the designers about during our process was that the concepts should never overpower the efforts of the two of you guys. It's really about these two performers doing all of this magic, right? So we have to en en encapsulate it, we have to enforce it, we have to support it through the design, not ever overpower it and make it you know, too much about the designs themselves. Or we can lose the humor. Um, style, this is obviously campy style. Ludlum, Theater of the Ridiculous, um, John Vaccaro were some of the originators of camp, what became camp style. So this is truly a very clear and specific sort of performing style. Played very broadly within the situations are extremely important to the characters. Ludlam said, our slant was actually to take things very seriously, especially focusing on those things held in low self-esteem by society and revaluing them. 
giving them new meaning, new worth, by changing their context. Spoof and send up a famous melodrama. There's the brooding hero, there's the fainting heroine, there's the mysterious <coughs> creepy servant, there's the dead wife, or is she dead? These are all sort of archetypes, right? Uh, instead of a magic show, and this is how we're approaching this, this is a magic show of quick change. Okay? The magic is in how fast you guys change those costumes. Okay? Allison is fully aware of this, um, and we've been talking about how to make those happen as smoothly as possible. You will, there will be two dressers backstage full time that will be working with you, and every move will be choreographed. Um, as you know from reading the script, there are times you're changing costume in about three seconds while you're talking to yourself. Right. Okay. And did I read it right that there's a point at which I'm talking to myself, my hand leaves, gets a wolf claw put on it, and comes back in all while I'm leading it on stage? Yep. Thanks. Yep. <laughs> um, well, and in fact, you have one scene where you're playing Nicodemus and Enid at the same time. Right. Yeah. You know, I mean, you literally have That's what I'm talking two about. half costumes on, and you lean oh. out. And you, you know, Nicodemus, and then you turn around, and they plop the wig on your head, and you're Lady Enid. And I kiss my own hand. Right. Yeah. 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 Which I do in. in. Yeah, I'm glad you're right. So yeah, it's it's pretty nutty. I'll I'll let you know. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Um, so it is a quick change show. It needs to be magical. There's also elements in here of burlesque, drag theater, all combined with melodrama. This was some of the essence of the ridiculous theater, and I found some quotes online of that people were saying Ludlum was on his way to becoming the Moliere of our time. Right? A lot of his comedy kind of followed that French farce sort of style. Of course, his life ended pretty early. He died of AIDS in, I think, 87. Um, a quote, Ludlum never settled for being merely funny. He also wanted his plays to be slightly satirical and wicked and to work as drama, with characters who moved audiences even as they made them laugh. The fact that Ludlum also preferred his plays to be full of men playing women was not meant to, wait to take away from their power. Um, lots of source materials pulled into this thing. We've already talked about Rebecca, that's a big one. If any of you have not seen the movie Rebecca, please go rent it, because it will tell you a lot about this show. Um, the other movie that Act 2 comes a lot from is The Mummy's Curse, an even older film. Pretty fun, too. It's fun to watch. That one's available even like the streaming Netflix. Um, there's a little Jane Eyre in here, Frankenstein, Dracula, Wolfman, quotes from Macbeth, Hamlet, Edgar Allan Poe. We're even going to be doing a little reference to Gone with the Wind when Enid comes out in the dress, 